Hey everyone, it's Mr. Sinti. Today I have the joy of introducing to you the wonderful world of neural tissue. That's right, neural tissue, as the name may imply, is uh, a grouping of all different kinds of cells that are responsible for coordinating our movements, uh, processing information, sensory information from the outside world, thinking, learning, feeling, emotion, basically controlling all aspects of the human body. That's right. How's that for, uh, for an introduction? I think it's going to be good. I, ho I hope you'll uh, enjoy it and uh, learn something. And so there's two main types of cells that are involved in neural tissue. And that, those are neurons, which are shown here in these diagrams as being these large cell bodies right here. And then there's these supportive cells called neuroglia cells. And so uh, this particular video is about both those kinds of cells. And so right out of the gate, neurons are the cells that receive information and uh, communicate and send. So they're sending and receiving information. Uh, and there's many of them in the body. There's over 100 billion neurons uh, in the body. And they look kind of cool, uh, if you ask me. They have these large cell bodies where most of the organelles are composed. Uh, contained uh, nucleus is, is located in here and then they have these branching more pictures to come they have these branching extensions called dendrites which remind early anatomists of branches of a tree and so dendrite meaning tree then they have a uh, long extension coming off sort of like an extension cord called an axon and then it reaches a, a terminal more about that as time goes by in the video these neuroglia cells are just simply called glial cells. They're, they're the ones that support and protect the neurons. And so they're, they're really important because the neurons need that uh, support. And so they're non-neuronal cells, and there are many different kinds. And uh, some of them even will form myelin, which is uh, basically uh, the glial cell themselves, believe it or not, wraps around the neuronal axon in order to insulate it. More about that coming. Uh, and, they're, and these glial cells are found both in the central and peripheral nervous systems, which uh, leads me to want to explain that. So the central uh, nervous system and peripheral nervous system combined make up the, the two anatomical divisions of our nervous system. And as the name may apply, uh, insinuate, the central nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord. Okay, so... Uh, most important central uh, brain and spinal cord and then anything that's not the brain and the spinal cord is the peripheral nervous system and so this what is the central nervous system doing its main function is to process and coordinate information and so that that's kind of a lot so sensory data from inside and outside of the body needs to be processed by by the brain motor commands uh, control activities. In other words, the, the decision to move skeletal muscles is coming from the central nervous system. Uh, and then as I perhaps uh, mentioned before, higher brain functions such as intelligence and memory, learning, emotion, all of this is controlled in the central nervous system. But the peripheral nervous system includes everything but the, the brain and the spinal cord, and there's divisions of the peripheral nervous system as well, further subdivisions for, in order to, don't become frustrated with that, but it's in order to uh, become further acquainted and also in order to organize. Uh, as one might imagine, the nervous system is rather complex, but if you break it up, it's a little bit easier to, to deal with. And so the function of the peripheral nervous system is to deliver the sensory information. In other words, touch and smell and vision are then delivered from those sensory neurons to the brain, to the central nervous system. And then they're also the ones that are carrying out the motor commands. In other words, to, I think I shall move my hand. Uh, it's the peripheral nerves that are actually carrying that out. The motor neuron, if you will, will interact with the skeletal muscle, which will cause um, the muscle to move. And it can also interact with other systems of the body as well. So these nerves of the peripheral nervous system, sometimes just referred to as peripheral nerves, they carry out uh, sensory information, as I was mentioning before, they carry that information to the central nervous system and they carry out motor commands uh, as, as well. 
So they're the sort of the connection between the central nervous system and getting things done. And uh, just to highlight two particular uh, significantly important <laughs> types of cells of the peripheral nervous system are the cranial nerves. Now, these are the ones that connect directly to the brain. And so an example of that, were, for example, if you're, when you're looking at this video, your optic nerve, which is connecting uh, the, the vision that you're seeing in the back of your retina to, to, your, uh, to your brain, the occipital lobe of the brain in particular, is uh, a cranial nerve. The cochlear nerve is an example of, of a cranial nerve as well, uh, connecting uh, sound to the brain. And then spinal nerves are important uh, examples of the peripheral nervous system because they're attached to the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system, but they extend uh, laterally uh, to all parts of the body. And so let's talk about how things, how uh, information comes in and comes out of the nervous system. And so this is kind of a discussion that uh, we like to categorize as being functional classifications of neurons, functional classifications, as opposed to structural, which, which I'll mention uh, shortly. So if we have a stimulus coming into the body, uh, then we're going to respond to it. Uh, and evolutionarily speaking, that's significant because we want to, uh, if, the, if the stimulus is good, we want to sort of hang out with it. And if the stimulus is negative or if there's some sort of threat, we want to respond and get away from it, sort of fight or flight uh, response. And so what we categorize as when the stimulus comes in, like, for example, this is a cross section of the skin here, uh, the sensory neurons that are found in the skin and there there are several kinds although this video isn't about that but the central the sensory neurons of, uh, are referred to as receptors and so these receptors will receive like light touch or, or deep pressure and they will send that information through a sensory neuron in what is referred to as the afferent part of communication in other words coming toward afferent coming toward the central ner nervous system and so stimulus comes in receptor neurons uh, uh, receptors which are, are the tissue that that receives that are the impulse is carried through a sensory neuron usually a unipolar and I'll mention uh, this is a, an example of a classification of structure of, of a neuron and it comes into the central nervous system afferent and so here, here's an example of that. So here is, for example, a bell ringing down below here. And so the receptor is, is picking that up. And in this case, the receptor is ultimately the uh, cochlea, which is in the inner ear, the uh, circular uh, structure, which is going to detect uh, sound waves. And what happens is that nerve uh, called the cochlear nerve, which is, if you remember, is a cranial nerve, is part of the uh, peripheral nervous system and it's a sensory neuron in other words it's going to conduct through afferent pathway to the central nervous system directly to the brain in this case okay so it's carrying auditory sensory information from the cochlea directly to the brain pretty cool so that's afferent in other words coming in okay so what do you do with it well <laughs> You know, maybe if you hear a bell, uh, this is somewhat ridiculous, but if you hear a bell, maybe that means to stand or maybe that means to sit down or something like that, some sort of command. And so check this out. So when, when you hear the bell and the brain processes that, then it'll send impulses down, for example, in the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system. And then that'll ultimately result in a, in a motor neuron uh, connecting to an effector, in this case, a muscle cell skeletal muscle cell, though an effector could be a gland as well. And that'll initiate a response. So this is the efferent. Okay, so you have afferent and efferent. Okay, so that, that's sort of the big picture. But let me just hang out a little bit on the afferent a little bit. So that as to review that carrying sensory information, like for example, the bell ringing, and that's uh, from the peripheral nervous system, and it's going to the central nervous system. Well, within the central nervous system, all those cells in the central nervous system are, are referred to as interneurons. And so those are communicating as well. And then ultimately, the interneuron links to a motor neuron, in this case, uh, because it's going to affect motion. It, okay. So the afferent 
uh, division again, just to sort of close the book, are receptors. It could be the skin, it could be your eyes, it could be your ears, are detecting and then responding to that stimulus. And those neurons are specialized, um, and which are pretty cool, uh, the special, specialized types of neurons that can pick up all of those uh, information. Like there's chemical uh, senses, there's pressure, there's um, sound, it's pre pretty awesome. So those are complex sensory organs, receptors are. And so they're gonna send that information. Okay, and those are, again, afferent neurons of the peripheral nervous system, the sensory neurons, and then ultimately that, that will result in perhaps a response, and those are motor neurons, and those are the efferent neurons of the peripheral nervous system. And then, as I was mentioning before, this is sort of uh, summarizing it, the interneurons are the association neurons. They're mostly in the brain, the spinal cord, and they distribute that sensory information that's coming in through the afferent uh, pathway uh, and then are involved in making decisions about what to do about that information okay and so again just to summarize it afferent comes in uh, it's communicated by the inner neurons of the central nervous system system and then efferent and there's some kind of response okay and let's talk a little bit about the response of that efferent pathway just a little bit and so here's here's a, a signal coming in uh, here uh, here's your interneuron processing the information right in here. And then here's a, a motor neuron, uh, for example, which is part of the afferent pathway. Now, I just want to point out something here that there's sort of a break here in the, in the peripheral efferent nervous system. You could consider, again, subclassification. There's the somatic system as part of the peripheral nervous system associated, as I was mentioning before, with skeletal movements and some sort of response, but which is voluntary, of course. But there's also this autonomic, you might be familiar with this, this autonomic portion of, of the response could either be sympathetic or parasympathetic, and that's um, involuntary or um, not conscious. Okay, and so the efferent is the one that's carrying out the, the command from the central nervous system to a skeletal muscle or a gland, if you will. And the, again, just to review this, the somatic portion of that is controlling, like for example, a motor neur neuron is a great example of an efferent neuron, uh, motor neuron, because it's causing uh, the muscle fiber to contract. Again, uh, it's voluntary. But the autonomic is still part of the efferent division of the peripheral nervous system, but it's subconscious. It, it involves smooth muscle contraction, like for example, the muscles of the, of the wall of the alimentary canal, smooth, smooth muscle fibers and, and, uh, and various organs it is involved in cardiac muscle contraction and glandular secretions. And, uh, Again, subdivision, there's sympathetic, which has a stimulating effect to get going and a parasympathetic uh, uh, disposition in order to uh, curtail or relax a particular effect, okay? Now, let's switch our, our attention now to structural components of the, of the neuron. And so I'm gonna just do a little brief uh, discussion about structure of neurons are pretty cool. As I mentioned before, they're the functional units of the nervous system and the neuroglia cells which are coming are going to be supportive. And so you can see here right in this picture, here's the soma or cell body, if you will, of, of a neuron. And then you can see the, the nucleus right over here. And these are the neuroglia nuclei that are surrounding the large neuron in the center there. Okay, so the cell body or soma has a large nucleus, a nucleolus, which is nucleolus, if you're unfamiliar, is the site of where ribosomal uh, subunits are assembled, the, the, also the site of uh, ribosomal RNA synthesis. There's also all kinds of mitochondria which produce ATP, which are located in the soma, although those mitochondria, truth be told, are also found in the axon as well. And there's, a, there's a, an abundance of ribosomal RNA, um, which are, are important in packaging protein in vesicles found in the soma, uh, which are re really relevant in this discussion. Although protein synthesis is always relevant, I just wanna point that out. But in particular, 
some of the proteins that neurons are producing are neurotransmitters and these protein chemicals and small amino acid uh, oligopeptides and dipeptides are important neurotransmitters. Those are going to be the chemicals, spoiler alert, those are going to be the chemicals that are secreted from the axon terminus uh, to another neuron or to a, to, a, uh, to a muscle cell or to a gland. So that's where neurotransmitters are produced in the cell body. Okay, And also inside uh, you can find what are called neurofibers. Now these are not anything that are too particular to neurons. They're found in most cells and they're made up of protein fibers, both thick and thin filaments. Like for example, uh, the cytoskeleton uh, made up of tubulin protein are, are composed of uh, uh, part of the neurofibril network. And they provide support and also transportation for vesicles along the axon. So those are, those are kind of cool. You might be familiar with uh, muscle fibers, uh, which are which is another way of saying a muscle cell, are composed of myofibrils, and there's all kinds of proteins there. Now, I wanted to point out this area here. Like, do you notice how uh, along right next to the nucleus and nucleolus, there's all this sort of darkened structure here? This darkened structure is just the the predominance of uh, ribosomal RNA and ribosomes in general, and they're they're referred to as uh, nesyl or nestle or missile nissle bodies difficult to, to to say how that would be pronounced i'm going to go nissle bodies and ultimately depending on the stain or no stain it's going to cause the neuron to have sort of a gray darkened appearance and so you may have heard of some tissue in the nervous system being referred to as gray matter and so the gray matter comes from the fact that these the soma is just so filled with um, ribosomes that it appears gray from the nissle bodies okay and then I was mentioning before at the top of the video these tree-like extensions that come off of the soma these are called dendrites dendrites receive information really important they receive information from other neurons now I say other neurons but the truth is if this is a sensory neuron uh, perhaps it's receiving information uh, in other forms like for example sound or chemical but they're basically the the site of which neurons are receiving information and there there are many many of them and they're very fine processes that that extend from the uh, the soma of the cell and just sort of a, a little shot they're highly branched just a shout out I, I have to mention this that uh, Santiago uh, Ramoni Cajal uh, Spanish a uh, neural uh, anatomist who ultimately became a physician, became an anatomy professor, following sort of in the footsteps of his father. Um, interesting background. He, he always wanted to become an artist. And I, and I guess in many ways he, he was an artist because um, he contributed so much to the, um, to the field of neuroscience because of his artistic ability. He used, just really briefly, he used some really cool stains from an Italian scientist by the name of Golgi and was able to really sit down and draw out, look at the dendrites of these cells right here. And so you could see clearly that, and if you wanted to peruse the internet and look at some of the, some of the drawings from uh, Cajal, they're just incredible. Uh, they're still state of the art today, uh, even though they were done uh, many, many years ago. Uh, there's some cool stories about um, him when, as a youngster, <laughs> Uh, kind of crazy, like going to a, a graveyard and pulling up, exhuming bodies with his father in order to study uh, the anatomy of bones. And uh, he be, ultimately became uh, really specialized in, in neurohistology. And so pretty cool. So the point being back to this is that uh, around 90% of the surface area of a neuron are these dendrites. So one might conclude from this correctly that receiving information is really an important aspect of uh, the function of a neuron and then transmitting that though is really important and then this extension that comes off the the soma called the axon is really long carries uh, an electrical signal called an action potential this video is not about an action potential but i may allude to it a little bit uh, the inside of the cell of a neuron resting is negative relative to the outside of the cell, which is positive, and a 
reversal of charge that propagates down the axon is called an axon potential, and that ena enables the, the, the neuron to communicate. So uh, the axon structure is really uh, critical uh, because it transmits a neurotransmitter that, that are being produced in the, in the uh, soma, but it's also propagating the action potential. So the axon is very important. And the, uh, the, the axon membrane, or the neuronal membrane, if you will, is also very important because it contains important ion channels. And so speaking of this, the axolema, as it's referred to, is the specialized membrane of the, of the neuron. And more about that to come. There's many particular uh, proteins that are found, ion channels, in the neuronal membrane or axolema that are very critical to receiving information from other neurons in the dendrite and also propagating a nerve impulse and also releasing neurotransmitter. So the neuronal membrane or axolema, very important. No hyperbole alert necessary there. And then the ax axial plasma, plasm is the liquid plasma of the, uh, of the cell. Okay, and a region that I want to point out that's particularly important as well as is the transition from the soma, which you can see here, to the axon. This region right over here is referred to as the axon helic. It's a thicker uh, portion of, uh, of the cell body and it's important in initiating the action potential. I'll just leave that as a little bit of a mystery. <laughs> Okay, and continuing with further structure of the uh, of the uh, neuron because it's to totally interesting is that when this axon comes down, uh, there's many branches that can come off of it, and those are known as as collaterals, branches of, of the single axon, and then ultimately they reach uh, sort of the the terminal or the terminus, and there you get this word uh, telodendra, uh, dendra, uh, telo or telomere or telophase, if you recall this from biology, meaning the end, the end of the dendrite, or the, the fine extensions of the, of the distal portion of the axon. And then finally, the axon uh, terminals, which are the very tips right over here. And that's where the neurotransmitter, as you can see here in these little vesicles, are stored. And the synapse is the region between the neuron and we'll say another neuron. They don't actually touch. It, the synapse is also the place where a neuron comes to greet a muscle cell or a gland. A synapse is sort of the meeting of coming together. If, if you're familiar with um, cellular biology, sometimes we refer to as homologous chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis. They come together uh, in synapse forming a tetrad. And so a synapse is the coming together of neurons, but there's no physical contact. Okay. Now to further uh, describe this so that we can communicate more clearly, not to confuse, but to actually illuminate understanding is that the cell that is uh, sending the message, the cell that's sending it is the presynaptic cell. And the one that's receiving it is the post. So one's sending neurotransmitter, the one receiving it is the postsynaptic cell. And then the synaptic cleft is that small gap that I was referring to uh, in the synapse that separates those two cells. Okay, uh, incredible scanning electron micrograph of uh, the end of the, of the axons, you know, the synaptic terminus right over here, these little terminals, and those contain neurotransmitter right there, and it's an exp expanded area and uh, of the presynaptic neuron. And those are the ones that are sending the, uh, the message via neurotransmitter, okay? Uh, very cool picture, uh, colorized um, transmission electron micrograph. You can see here uh, what, it, the, what we were just talking about. It's, it's a cool thing. This is scanning electron micrograph of the synaptic terminal. And this is transmission electron micrograph of the synaptic terminal. And you can see here in the colored in green, these are the uh, the vesicles that are carrying neurotransmitter that are going to be going into the synaptic cleft. Now, when the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft, uh, ultimately that's where it's broken down as well, because that information is temporary and then you want to uh, reabsorb it so it can be used again. And so 
so many cool factors, but this one, uh, I, 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 I'm, my personality is that of being a little bit of a biased uh, person. And I have a favorite um, component of uh, how neurotransmitters are conducted uh, along the axon. And so this is known as the axoplasmic transport system. And so I mentioned this before and how uh, neurotransmitters are produced in the som soma, but these neurotubules extend all the way down in the axon. And so they're like these cables, like a monorail, if you will. And this is where the vesicles that are uh, traveling move. And so in order to assure that they're moving in a, in a uni direction, in other words, towards the terminus of the cell, you ready for this? These vesicles carrying neurotransmitter shown here in these pictures are actually carried by proteins over their head called kinesin and there's there's another kind called uh, um, other there's other neuro uh, motor neurons but this one uh, dianine but this kinesin is really cool it literally like holds these vesicles of neurotransmitter and it, of course it's powered by mitochondria because it's producing ATP and the ATP the phosphates are connecting to these proteins allowing them to move along. And so you got to see this. I got to take a, take a little break from this video and show you this. Um, some graduate students at Harvard University made this uh, video called The Inner Workings of the Cell. It's really awesome. Check this out. So this is in the axon of a neuron. And inside this vesicle right here is neurotransmitter. And, and this is the kinesin motor protein carrying it down to the synaptic uh, uh, terminus. It, it's, it's quite unbelievable that this is happening inside your body, inside a neuron. And so there's all these cables inside the cell. So, pretty cool, huh? I thought, I thought you would enjoy watching that. I hope you did. <laughs> okay, let's come back over here. All right, so kinesin, just carrying it taking care of matters and so um, what's happening is again we're taking it down to if you will if the if the if the junction uh, where the nerve meets another cell type is a muscle it's referred to as a neuromuscular junction and that's the synapse between a neuron and a muscle cell or if it's between a nerve cell and and a gland uh, causing it to want to secrete for example, it's referred to as a neuroglandular junction. And then here's an actual light micrograph of the muscle tissue. And then here are, is the neuromuscular junction right here. Here's the neuron um, branching off in the synaptic terminals, which are uh, carrying uh, neurotransmitter. Okay. And I say neurotransmitter because that it's predominantly neurotransmitter, these little green structures right here. And again, this is a cartoon drawing of neurotransmitter. Um, but these are this is an actual photograph under the microscope, transmission electron micrograph of the same thing, neurotransmitter, pretty cool. But they could be any molecule. I want to broaden that a little bit. It's any kind of neuro, neuro, neuron secretion that uh, communicates. And, and basically, they're called uh, neurocrines, neurocrine. And so those could be, uh, again, neurohormone-like molecules, not necessarily neurotransmitter, and they can be amino acids. Um, if you wanted to look up neurocrine on the internet and find all the different kinds, or if you have a textbook where you're studying with that, uh, you could take a look at all the different neurocrines. It's pretty, pretty interesting. And this is where you get into a conversation about um, the different kinds of medicines that will uh, inhibit or enhance uh, neuro neurocrine uh, functionality, different drugs uh, that are involved in um, putting patients under or, or redu uh, during surgery or reducing pain. Really important. Anesthesiology uh, uh, is the field. Okay. And so again, this is a close up of this uh, sort of here's the post. This is the cell that's receiving the neurotransmitter. Here's the sy synaptic cleft in between. Here's the synaptic vesicles that carry neurocrines. Here's mitochondria right there. And then again, here's the axon terminal right in here. All right. And so let's get into the different kinds of neurons that, that, that you would find. And, and uh, there's basically four 
uh, fundamental types of neurons based on their structure. And so let's let's talk about that. You have this uh, anaxonic neuron, in other words, uh, a neuron with you know, without a neur uh, an axon. And so this is kind of interesting. This is found in the brain, sensory organs. You have these bipolar neurons, and these are found s particularly in sensory organs. And then you have unipolar neurons, and these are found uh, in the sen sensory neurons. I was alluding to this before. These are the ones that are carrying in the peripheral nervous system, carrying impulses uh, in the afferent uh, component. In other words, sending information uh, to the central nervous system. And then you have multipolar neurons. And those are classic example of that is a motor neuron. And those are, um, those are also common though in the central nervous system. So multi, multipolar neurons. All right, so let's look at this an anaxonic neuron. And so they're, they're pretty small and all the cell processes sort of look alike. And they're found again, I mentioned before in the brain. And so they're, uh, the, they have more than two processes and they're all dendrites, if you will. So no axon. Uh, bipolar, the name may <laughs> suggest why it was called that, that there's two processes, bi, coming off of the soma uh, that are very clear. One being a dendrite, the other one being an axon. Okay. Uh, these are fairly rare. I was mentioning they're found in uh, receptors, like for example, in the eye. Um, okay, bipolar. And then the multipolar, uh, common in the central nervous system. Uh, uh, you can see the reason they're called multipolar uh, is that there's many uh, connections to the, to the soma. These are the dendrite connections, and then there's a connection there as being the axon, single long axon. There's an uh, Here's a picture of a multipolar neuron under the light microscope. And then uh, more about the multipolar. Uh, uh, they're most common. I mentioned that before. There's many dendrites, one axon. They have very long axons. Just uh, a, a picture from our Cajal uh, um, uh, of a uh, per Purkinje cell. A Purkinje cell is a... Uh, <laughs> is a type of cell found in, this, in the cerebellum of the brain. And it was named after a Czech anatomist called per, Perkinji. Perkinji. And uh, it's a GABAergic neuron. In other words, it, it's the one that is uh, secreting uh, GABA, which is a type of neurotransmitter. But you can see here that it's multipolar, a Perkin, Perkinji cell. Okay, And the flow of information uh, is from the dendrite in one direction, down the axon, and then communicating uh, with, like for example, another neuron over here. So it's a, you receive information through the dendrites, and then you communicate that information using neurotransmitter in the, uh, as the information is carrying down. Now, these unipolar uh, uh, ne neurons are kind of interesting, and so they're sometimes called pseudo-uni neurons. And, the, that name is kind of interesting because, as it turns out, as during embryonic development, as these neurons are, are forming, um, it's it's sort of that where the cell body is uh, forming, uh, it gave the impression that there, there was sort of a uni uh, a, a pseudo uh, extension coming off of it. But we could just, for our intensive purposes, call it a, a unipolar neuron. And so what you have is an axon and an axon uh, coming off. Uni meaning there's one sort of branch coming off of this. Okay. And that the dendrites are fused to the axon right there uh, on the top. And then, so this is where it's receiving information. And then this is where it's transmitting information. They have very long axons. They're... Um, they're found uh, mostly as, as sensory neurons, as mentioned before, part of the afferent uh, peripheral nervous system, right there, peripheral nervous system. Okay, and then these are uh, sort of a summation slide of the four kinds, uh, structurally speaking, of neurons. Okay, now let's talk about these neuroglia uh, cells. These are really important too. And so they make up half the volume of the nervous system. And 
There's certain ne neuroglia cells that are found in particular in the central nervous system, that, that is, again, the brain and the spinal cord, and then other neuroglia cells are found in the peripheral nervous system. So let's first look at the central nervous system. You have these ependymal cells, uh, astrocytes, sort of sounds like a star cell, and then oligodendrocytes and microglia glia cells. And so there's four kinds found in the central nervous system. And so these ependymal cells are interesting. They, they have this uh, cilia that extends from these glial cells. Now these are not neurons. Now these are, they line sort of the spinal cord. And again, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the spinal cord or the various ventricles or cavities of the brain, but they line those structures and they secrete uh, CSF, or which is known as cerebral spinal fluid. And so when they secrete that, that uh, fluid, they also circulate it using their cilia. Okay, another picture of that as well. So you can see here that they, uh, under the light microscope, showing these particular cells that line um, the central canal of the spinal cord right in here. And so they produce CSF. And so they help to circulate that. Now these astrocytes are actually called astrocytes because they look like stars. And so they're shown here in purple. Uh, and then the neurons are shown in green. And so these are the purple ones are, are glia cells. And the glia cells are astrocytes. What do they do? They, re they repair damaged neural tissue. And so that's important. They also help to control the interstitial in, uh, cell environment and regulate um, ions in, in, the, uh, in the fluid. And I find this to be particularly interesting part of their function. Not a lot is known about these, the glial cells. And, and uh, as I was spending time researching this, I was sort of always amazed at um, something that is important as this is not really known. And so th this is a perhaps uh, a, d a detail, but I found it particularly interesting in my research on astrocytes in that they, they, they repair neural tissue and you're like, okay, they repair neural tissue. But what's happening is that when neurons um, have damage done to them and they, uh, in particular, they're having difficult with their mitochondria, which is really important in producing ATP in order to, to, uh, to do what neurons do in the action potential, they, uh, they actually, these astrocytes lend a hand and they actually uh, are able to share um, uh, ATP with with the neuron <laughs> so that's that's pretty important and so they they actually donate their uh, extra mitochondria to these sort of uh, desperately needing neurons and they look really cool under the microscope you can see they're, they're literally like little stars or aster astronomy okay and then these oligodendrocytes are also really cool okay oligo meaning a few dendrocyte now what they do is that they help to myelinate the axons of neurons, okay? And they do that in the in the central nervous system. And so what they do is they uh, the cells themselves wrap around. And if you're familiar with the fact of a, of a of a cell membrane is is made up of a phospholipid bilayer, so it's a lot of lipid. And so what they do is they insulate and they wrap around. Uh, not continuously, but in segments, a myelin sheath, which is this lipid-like material that surrounds the axon, uh, and it helps to speed up the signal of the action potential. So it's a better picture of this. So uh, this is, again, in the central nervous system. And I want to emphasize that because there's a different type of cell called a Schwann cell uh, that myelinates ax axons in the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system has these oligodendrocytes. So check this out. They extend and they wrap their membranes around other neurons. And in so doing, they myelinate it. And so that helps to speed up the action potential in a neuron. Okay. And so again, I was alluding to this before, the oligodendrite is kind of similar to the, um, in the peripheral nervous system, a Schwann cell, which again, just is a type of glial cell that wraps itself up around the axon of a neuron, but not continuously. There's little spaces 
uh, called nodes of Ranvier that are important because it's in those areas. I can't really go too far into it, though I have a tendency to want to do it, but there, there, I have another video describing the importance of the action potential and how that works. But I'll just say it briefly, hopefully, hopefully you'll catch it, is that a lot of uh, sodium voltage gated ion channels are located in these nodes of Ron VA, and therefore the nerve uh, impulse known as an action potential is able to propagate more quickly when cells are myelinated. So it increases myelinization, increases nerve transportation speed. Okay, so that's important. Again, this is in the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes. You can see them here uh, wrapping themselves around axons. So helpful and supportive of these glial cells. <laughs> okay, uh, again, uh, the the internode area is where the myelinization takes place, and then the node is where there is no myelin, and th therefore they're known as nodes of Ron VA, person who first discovered them, and those are the gaps. And again, it increases uh, action potential speed in the central nervous system, and in the central nervous system, uh, neural tissue that appears white, or in other words, white matter, is white matter because it's surrounded by uh, myelin uh, from oligodendrocytes. There you go. And so white matter is regions of the central nervous system that are myelinated, and those help their, uh, to increase speed. And it's the gray matter are uh, areas in the central nervous system that do not have myelinated cells. Okay, there it is. So here's a here's a fun fact. In turn, you know, I was mentioning speed, but you're like, well, how fast are we talking about? Well, uh, axons that are insulated with myelin, in other words, the white matter, uh, by oligodendrocytes. Uh, look at this, 224 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. And then axons that are not insulated, 2.2 uh, miles per hour. And again, it has to do with the fact that the the nerve impulse uh, is occurring. Uh, in, a, in a sort of a leaping, if you will, uh, fashion as opposed to it's sort of just moving down continuously. Okay, and so finally, the the microglia cells are, are migrate throughout the nervous system, uh, nervous tissue, the central nervous system, and what what is their function? They they're supportive, and they do that by uh, cleaning up any waste in the interstitial fluid, and they they also help to destroy. Uh, pathogens, like for example, uh, bacteria that might be causing uh, difficulty. So it's a type of glia cell located in the brain and spinal cord, and they help to uh, defend. And so they account for, how about this, 10 to 15 percent of cells found within the brain. That's kind of significant. And so they're, they're your sort of resident macrophage, meaning the big eater. Uh, and so they are the sort of the main um, form of, uh, of immunity in the central nervous system. Uh, pretty interesting. Okay, some cartoons of that. Uh, here are the big neuron cells right in here. Here's gray matter because you can notice that there's no oligodendrocytes, so the so there's no myelinization uh, taking place. Here's the um, microglial glial cells that we we're just talking about. Here's the uh, cells uh, producing uh, spinal fluid right in here. Uh, in, in the central canal, the CSF, okay? And then here is a, a picture of white matter. Uh, and you can see here's the oligodendrocytes myelinating, in other words, wrapping their membrane around and around and around and around. Uh, it kind of reminds me of if you had a stick representing a axon and you had an almost finished um, tube of toothpaste and you were able to just wrap that around and around. And so the cells uh, create that lipid barrier. And then here's a summary of the various glial cells found in the central nervous system right there. Now I mentioned there's glial cells, neuroglial cells found in the peripheral nervous system. So there's only two kinds. There's the Schwann cell, which I alluded to before, which myelinates the axons, uh, and those are important. And then these satellite cells, which are um, also supportive, and they sort of act a little bit like the uh, like the astrocytes uh, 
uh, if you will. They help to um, support, protect, cushion, regulate the environment surrounding the neurons. You can see them, the nucleus of the satellite cells here shown in brown, everywhere you see an arrow. And the ends, of course, represent the soma of the, of the neuron. So they're, they surround the neurons in the peripheral nervous system tissue. And the swan cells, Schwann cells, are the ones that are really important. And those are the ones that myelinate the axons uh, in the peripheral nervous system. And they do that, again, by wrapping themselves around and around and around, which creates a lipid coating, which insulates the axon, sort of like a plastic would insulate an electric wire, okay? And it causes the, uh, the impulse to move very quickly uh, as a result of it. And there's a picture, uh, a cross-section of a myelinated axon. You can see it here. And so this would appear white uh, under the microscope as well. This is a really cool picture showing. Th these also remind me, and if you have kids, <laughs> remind me of the, the various water wings. You remember those things? Those you'd blow them up and you'd put them on the arms of your kids when they were just learning to swim. And so they're, they're sort of like these little flotation <laughs> lipids, uh, Schwann cells that wrap around. And uh, the cell um, locates its uh, sodium voltage gated channels in between the Schwann cells at, at the nodes, at the nodes of Ron VA, which help to increase the speed uh, down again this is a very awesome electron micrograph showing the myelinization around the axons pretty interesting okay uh, again transmission electron micrograph showing the thick myelin uh, lipid around the axon right there here's the schwann cell that wraps and wraps and wraps it around a very supportive glial cell and again um, here's a little fun fact in in that babies sometimes are are awkward uh, and for many reasons, but in movement, they have, they're sort of have difficulty when they're just learning to walk. And some part of that is the fact that um, their uh, nerve cells uh, lack myelinization. So the myelin sheets make the movement a little awkward because the speed in which the impulse is traveling is not as fast as it will be when all their neurons are fully myelinated. And then as a, on a sad note, uh, multiple sclerosis is, is a uh, deterioration of the of the Schwann cell, and so therefore it slows down impulses uh, and has detrimental effects. And so what we're talking about here is uh, saltatory propagation. It's when the action potential uh, moves along the myelinated axon, and it moves faster, uses less energy than continuous propagation. And it allows it to sort of, if you will, jump from node to Ron VA, node to Ron VA. And the depolarization occurs only at the nodes. And um, so in general, neurons sort of perform the communication in the in neural tissue, the processing and the control, and the neural glial cells sort of help the biochemistry. They support, protect, defend, uh, and help the uh, neurons ultimately survive and function. Okay? And so that propagation is really important. I was mentioning that moves down the axon. And so uh, I found uh, that when trying to describe uh, continuous propagation and this so sort of uh, saltatory propagation, in other words, the jumping as a result of the myelinization, is best illustrated by a video. And so I'm going to show a little portion of this. Action potentials propagate in a continuous fashion in unmyelinated axons. Okay, and I'm going to fast forward it to right here where it actually talks about myelinization. In myelinated axons, action potential propagation is a bit different. Here they propagate in a saltatory or leaping fashion. The myelin sheath consists of multiple layers of tightly wrapped glial cell membrane. But this sheath is not a continuous one. Exposed areas of axonal membrane, known as nodes of Ranvier, occur at discrete intervals. Voltage-gated sodium channels are abundant. Okay, so Again, uh, I, I found that that's sufficient for this particular video. Um, there's more about action potentials 
in in uh, in other videos. If you're interested in that, I welcome you to to check that out. And I and I want to finish with this. In in addition to myelinization, in terms of it affecting the speed of a nervous uh, of an action potential, the diameter of the axon is also really important. And so the larger the diameter of the axon, the faster the action potential will move. And that and that just simply it just has lower resistance uh, this way, and so it'll increase the speed of propagation. And so uh, neurologists like to um, classify uh, their nerve fibers in three basic types. And you have your type A uh, uh, nerve or neuron, which is your fastest one, and your type C, which is your slowest one, and sort of B is intermediate. And so they're grouped by diameter. Again, you might have you might have predicted the A or the largest diameter, C or the or, or not, and then the speed. And so it goes from fastest to slowest. And so let's take a look at this. So type A is myelinated, it has a large diameter, its speed is 140 meters per second on average. It carries information uh, very rapidly um, to and from the central nervous system. Things that are most critical need to be conducted very, very quickly. And for example, um, uh, position, balance, uh, touch, and motor, motor impulses. Uh, type B fibers are, are myelinated, uh, medium in diameter, speeds uh, not as fast, 18 meters per second, sort of intermediate, um, sensory information, uh, peripheral effectors are example of that. And then unmyelinated uh, tissue, in other words gray, is smaller diameter, very slow speed, one meter per second. And it's sort of involuntary kinds of uh, things like involuntary muscle and glandular control, as one might have predicted. Okay, and so basically what we're talking about is information is traveling through the nervous system and it's propagating via action potentials. And, you know, perhaps the most important, hard to say what's most important, but it might be vision, uh, balance and motor controls uh, are basically carried out by your largest diameter and your myelinated uh, type A fibers. Uh, and so there you have our uh, conclusion of this video on neural tissue discussing the uh, structural and functional classifications of both neurons and neuroglial cells in the uh, central and peripheral nervous system. Hopefully you enjoyed it and thought it was interesting. Thanks for watching.